Aquí vamos a comenzar. Está bien, ok. Bienvenidos todos. todos. Vamos, a, vamos a comenzar. Bienvenida, Lina. Eh, thank you again for giving us this wonderful course. Please can start to share your slides. Ok, thank you for inviting me once more. Okay. okay, can you see my perfect? Can you see my... Yes, okay. Uh, okay. Yes. Yes. okay. All right, so uh, we've had um, a uh, few lessons on how what the normal EEG looks like with the basis of the EEG. And today we're going to talk about EEG and epilepsy. So EEG and epilepsy is, is uh, mandatory. I think of do an EEG. And, uh, but before we go, we go on, I'd like to remind you, you know, make a little revision of what, kind, what kinds of epilepsy we have. So remember, we talked about this, there was a seizure classification, and the new seizure is this one, right? So seizure can have a focal onset when it starts only on one side uh, of both hemispheres or a generalized onset. And of course, there's always a little group of non onset. Well, if it has a focal onset, either the patient is aware or not aware with impaired awareness. This is what we used to call partial, uh, simple and partial complex. Well, names have changed, but it's more or less the same, right? And then focal onset, what do you have? Either you have a motor onset or a non-motor onset. And what we mean by motor onset is that the motor activity is exuberant, not only just few automatisms. Then focal, we used to call this generalized, uh, secondary generalized seizures. Now we say focal to bilateral tonic clonic. Okay, so the focal seizure can evolve to a bilateral clonic tonic seizure. And the generalized onset, you have the motor onset or non motor onset. So this would be more or less what, remember that the seizures, if it, they're focal seizures, the first symptom will depend on what area of the brain it's starting. So if it starts on, on the frontal cortex, you'll have focal motor, grimacing, uh, versive or controversive. If it's uh, the hippocampus, you can start having autonomic um, symptoms. Uh, if it's lateral temporal, you can have auditory symptoms. If it's occipital, you'll have visual and, uh, of course, somatosensory uh, the sensory area, but of course, focal motor and sensory are always together because they're so close. So these would be what they called the simple partial seizures, what we call now the focal seizures without impairment. And, or some people call them perceptive seizures or the, the seizures that have uh, uh, an impaired awareness. Some people call it this perceptive or a perceptive, which would be the complex partial seizures uh, up to now. So um, basically uh, the um, symptoms uh, can start being the same, but then the patient evolves to an impaired consciousness and then you can have these psychomotor phenomena like chewing movements, automatisms, and the patient is unaware of what's going on. Then of course the, uh, the generalized seizures, we, the big two groups are motor onset and non-motor onset. The classic generalized tonic seizure, I guess all of you had seen one at least once. There's the tonic phase in which the, the body is completely stiff and the patient stops breathing. Then you have the clonic phase in which you have clonic uh, movements, repeated movements. And then in the post-dictal post stage, the patient will be completely out. And we're going to see what happens in the electroencephalogram. And you have the non-motor and generalized seizures such as the absence seizure in which the patient just uh, turns off and then turns on again. Okay, so when we talk about seizure types, remember we've got the focal seizures, the generalized and unknown. Then based on this, we have the epilepsy type. So you may have a focal type of epilepsy 
generalized kind of epilepsy, eventually combined focal and some syndromes. And you've got the epilepsy syndrome. So what are the epilepsy syndromes? They're a group of uh, epilepsies that have the natural history, age of onset, the kind of seizure you have, how is this going to progress in the future, and they have a characteristic um, EG. So we call these the electroclinical syndromes. Why? Because you've got the clinical uh, observation and you've got a, um, a almost pathognomonic uh, electroencephalogram. For example, one that everybody knows is, where is it here? Childhood absence epilepsy, right? So what do you have? A child that turns off and you've got that three spike wave, uh, three hertz spike wave generalized. This is uh, very common. And the non-electroclinical syndromes, which would be non-syndromic epilepsies, they divide it in, a, in two groups because some of these uh, syndromes or types of epilepsy are surgical, such as mesiotemporal lobe epilepsy with hypocampal sclerosis, okay? Uh, surgeons know these very well. This is the kind that we most um, uh, operate on, right? And well, we're going to go start with this one because, oh, sorry. Before that, here are some examples of syndromes that are related to age, right? So we've got West syndrome, we're going to talk about that. Then juvenile myoclonic epilepsy has these myoclonic jerks. And here is the, the absent seizure. See, the patient just has a vacant stare, he stops, the eyes may flutter, and he's got this very characteristic uh, three spike wave um, alteration and uh, begins and, and finishes very abruptly. And this one is benign, this one is benign, this is not benign. So it's always important to know when you're going to do an electroencephalogram, it's always important to know what the patient has before you, you see the, the exam. Of course, it's always like, a, a, how do you say, a home pick a basis, a jigsaw puzzle, right? You have to put the, uh, you have to get the electroencephalogram, the the imaging, the um, clinical features, and put them together to arrive to, to get to a diagnosis. Okay, so just remembering from the first lesson, you've got uh, interictal activity, right? Interictal is between seizures. It can be either generalized, the whole cortex, or it can be just focal, which is one part only of, uh, of the cortex. So this is, remember that uh, red was, uh, the left side and blue was the right side, and then you have the uh, midline. So what we see here, both red and blue sides have an activity which I can tell you now is epileptiform, right? Because it's very pointy and it's got a slow wave after it. So this would be generalized interictal. And this would be inter, uh, fo uh, interictal but focal because only one side has the... Um, the spike. Now, and remember that we saw the, um, uh, the phase reversal, and the phase reversal here shows that it is on the temporal lobe going a little bit to the frontal. Okay, so this is interictal. And when you have the seizure, what's the difference? Oops. So this is the generalized seizure, and you have the interictal activity, and a seizure is something that prolongs and builds up through time. So this would be like just the spark, and this would be the fire. It goes on and on. And this is, would be, this is the generalized interictal and ictal, and this is the focal, right? You have a focal activity, and then when you have the seizure, you have something that builds up. And you can see that it's mostly on the left side and not on the right, and you have this um, take, which you when you describe it, you don't say epileptiform. I'm just going to say that there is a buildup of uh, waves that are um, theta and the theta rhythm uh, and such, such and such a region, in this case, temporal region, right? When I call this epileptiform, I am already interpreting, okay? I'm not just describing. Okay, so, but these are the, the, the epileptiform um, modifications you see. So remember the sharp wave, right? The sharp wave is, actually they're both the same. Remember that the French call this quant, but then 
you can divide it into sharp wave, which is more than 70 milliseconds, and the spike, which is much more, uh, it's spiky, right? It's, it's, it's piccular, right? Uh, and this one is a little bit more open. And then you have, for example, the complexes like spike and wave, okay? Of course, you're not going to start measuring always because just by looking at it, you can see there's a pattern, right? This one is thin and this one is a little bit more open. Okay, so let's start with the most common uh, in adults, which is the mesial temporal lobe epilepsy with hippocampal sclerosis. For those of you who do not know what the hippocampus is, it's this structure. It's mainly, it's got, it, when you cut it transversely, you see a little mini cortex and it's called hippocampus because it looks like a seahorse and hippocampus is seahorse in, in Greek, apparently. So what's uh, important is remember that the hippocampus is very important when it's uh, for memory, memory formation, right? So here we have the EG. Now remember that everything that's, um, that's an odd number is on the left. Everything that's a, um, a number that's not odd is um, on the right, right? So I've got left, right, left and right. So this is temporal, temporal, and then parasagittal, parasagittal. So what do we have here? Where do I have something that's, that's it, uh, we call a transient, anything that suddenly pops out from the rest. You see, everything seems more or less the same, and then suddenly this thing pops out. So th this is a transient, and we can see that it's a sharp wave, right? It's a sharp wave and then has a slow wave, and the phase reversal is here in F8. What's F8? It's the anterior temporal um, electrode. But you may also have what we call bitemporal sharp waves, right? So I've got sharp waves on the left side, the left temporal, and on the right temporal here, sorry, right temporal, left temporal, uh, and they are independent. So this is what is important. I can only say that it's bitemporal when they are independent. If they they're together, then it would be synchronous. I don't know I, from what side it's coming, or maybe I do know from what side it's coming. But um, to categorize this as uh, bitemporal, it would have to be independent. So here we have some examples. So here's a person, right? He's got, he's got a focus here, right? And this is in F8. So it's a right temporal focus, and he's got a left temporal focus in F7. So he's got both and they're not together, right? Same patient. Now, sometimes you're looking at an exam and you find um, a, a, a sharp wave and you say, okay, I've got it. It's his left temporal. But if you go on, then you might have find something on the other side. So never say that you've seen an EEG until you've seen all the pages, because maybe on the last page, you'll find something different or on the other side. And here, the same patient, he's got the, the sharp waves on the left temporal and the right temporal on the same page. Okay, so that's interictal, right? Okay, when you have a seizure, so this example is showing here, this SP is phenoidal, okay? We don't use phenoidal electrodes anymore, but basically it's the um, temporal anterior electrode. So here, the uh, and on the right side, this patient starts having something, but this is 14 seconds before the clinical onset. So sometimes you do see something happening in the EEG before the patient is aware of it, which would we call a non-eloquent area. But then with the seizure proceeding and uh, evolving, you start having a uh, clinical onset and uh, remember, the seizure starts in a point and then it starts, uh, there's a, re it starts recruiting other uh, cellular uh, neuronal groups. So it builds up here and eight seconds into the seizure, it's building up and then 27 seconds into the seizure, it's gone over to the frontal uh, uh, lobe, also here to the other sphenoidal on the other side, okay? But what's important is that suddenly you have something that a phenomenon that builds up and looks looks biological. This is another pattern for a temporal lobe epilepsy, what they call hypermotor seizures. 
are the complex, what would be the complex partial that we now call the disperceptive, right? The focal disperceptive seizures. So sometimes you have this theta rhythm. So here's a uh, right temporal and a little bit of the parasagittal also has some of this activity, but mainly this is where it is happening. So it's something that grows up in time, that evolves in time to be called a, a seizure. So here we have the example of this person that's 28 years old. She has a normal MRI, but had a Gaston Gashford personality, which is very, it's a personality change, which is typical of temporal lobe epilepsy. So it's those patients that talk too much, that uh, write a lot, that have no, uh, they seem ill-mannered because they're always uh, interrupting and they, basically they glue onto you, right? So here's the subclinical onset. So where's this? Let's see. So it's here on the temporal lobe, the left temporal lobe. And where do we have the, the um, phase reversal? Here on F7, right? So it starts. And right here where it's marked seizure is when the patient starts having something clinical. So initially there is no clinical manifestation. Then on Remember, every page is 10 seconds, right? So this is 10 seconds. Then on the next 10 seconds, you can see that it's... At first, we only had it here on the temporal lobe, and now we also get some of the frontal lobe because the seizure is uh, recruiting more and more uh, groups, right? And it's uh, this pattern, right? These are not... They are not sharp waves, actually. They're sharply contoured, but they are in the theta uh, rhythm. And then they get sharper and sharper, right? Here on the left side, and they go a little bit to the frontal. And then during the seizure, see here is different from here. This side is different. The patient tries to answer, which means he can't speak, obviously, because the seizure is on the left side where most people have their language center. But he's trying to mimic, which means not always does the patient completely lose consciousness, their, their levels of uh, loss of awareness. And here the seizure ends. See, when it ends, it's completely different. You have, of course, you have lots of muscle, right? Here, right at the beginning, no muscle, right? And then here, when the patient starts trying to move, then you have a lot of this very fast activity, which is muscle. So you have to kind of filter that in your own head, see? And then when the seizure finishes, it doesn't move around so much. At the end of the seizure was, it took one and a half minutes, okay, which is more or less what a, a temporal lobe seizure will not last more than two or three minutes. Okay, what can happen? So this is the hippocampus, but seen from below. Remember when you have one hippocampus affected, the first thing you might have a strange smell or a strange sensation or deja vu, everybody heard of that, or fear, whatever, which is and might lose, might lose uh, awareness here. But eventually, let's say that the, uh, the uh, ictal activity progresses to the other hippocampus. So the patient will start having um, automatisms, right? And remember that the automatis are, automatisms are always ipsilateral to, this, to the temporal lobe that was first affected. And the dystonic uh, posture is always contralateral. But eventually this can uh, progress and uh, spread out to become a generalized seizure. So this, then you have the classic tonic-clonic seizure. But uh, this is what we used to call uh, secondary generalized. But now we, for several reasons, we prefer calling it uh, an evolving to tonic-clonic uh, bi tonic bilateral seizure. So this is what happens. So here we have right, the left side, the right side, and you can see that here on the right side, suddenly there's a rhythm, one, two, three, four, it's in the theta rhythm, um, and it's temporal, temp right temporal, so it starts, right, and then next page, okay, it gets a little bit sharper, a little bit faster, oops, sorry, this is the onset, right, and then the other side also starts to to have synchronized activity, which means it's passing over, and then suddenly it progresses to the tonic-clonic 
bilateral seizure. This is the tonic phase. See, everything is very fast. The patient is rigid. And then you've got the clonic phase. In the clonic phase, you've got a burst suppression, burst suppression, and this burst coincides with the clonic movement because the patient has a clonus and then relaxes, clonus and relaxes. Okay, so all this is activity. And as the seizure ends, what do you have? You have a suppression. It's as, it's as if the brain had um, shut off, you know, to reboot. So it's, for some time, the patient will be completely unconscious. This is a moment when you might have a, um, a step, right? Um, an unexpected uh, death caused by a seizure. And eventually, slowly, slowly, the patient comes back and the EEG slow, with slow waves, but does go back to the normal state. Okay, so now let's see, this is another patient. See, he's awake. You can see the, the eye movements, lots of muscle. And then he has this, something happened, which we can see is a little bit more on the left side than on the right side. And what he has is impaired awareness very fast. So this would also, this is also a, a focal seizure, right? But much, much faster. It has like one, two, three, four, like 10 seconds maximum. When it's a temporal lobe seizure, you consider the seizure, uh, the activity as a seizure when it lasts more than 10 seconds. That's established. Okay, so here we have another patient. She's 12 years old. She was bitemporal. And she starts the beginning of the seizure here. I'm having trouble. Does it begin here or does it begin here? Right, but let's go on. So actually, when it progresses, it's much clearer that the seizure is more on the left side than on the right side. And at the beginning of this seizure, this girl, it's incredible because for about like uh, the seizure lasted seven minutes. But the first two or three minutes, she, was, she wasn't feeling anything. And she was chatting and everything. We asked her, you know, what's going on? No, nothing is going on. Everything's perfectly okay. But then as the seizure progressed, she did become uh, unaware. And then this is the middle of the seizure. See, it was fast. First it starts slow, then it goes very fast, and then it starts slowing down again. And you can see that when the seizure uh, here, um, when the seizure ends, you can see that, um, it's kind of an ab abrupt ending. Not always is that it's that easy. Uh, and of course, it's you can see that only the left side was really involved. The right side is preserved so much so that you can see now that she closes her eyes, you can see the little the alpha rhythm here at the back, showing that this uh, hemisphere is fine and this one is much slower than the right one. Sometimes you can know you can know which side the seizure came off after a seizure. Because where the seizure was, you will have slower activity, which means excess of inhibition. Okay, so this is another patient. We saw her recently. So first of all, is she awake or is she asleep? Well, she's got these, um, uh, the, the spindles, the ustilus, nah, in sleep. And she's got something called post, which also happens in sleep, but I'll show that later. So she has this activity, interictal activity. She has a sharp wave followed by a slow wave, and it is on the right temporal lobe, right? Then, and this is also interictal, but see what happens. She's got slow waves instead of a spiky wave, lots of slow waves, and they don't last forever. And they're in the delta range. Look, one, two per second, right? So we call this turder, temporal, intermittent, rhythmic delta activity, okay? Which shows, this is important for surgeons because this shows where, if she's bitemporal, for example, this shows where the, the lesion is. The side that has the slow waves is probably the one that has uh, most lesion that would be interesting to operate on. Then this is, it, look, and. This is sleep, all right? Here's the interictal activity. And here are some sleep spindles, but they, they, they last for a long time. So you might mistake this for a seizure, right? This is the seizure. See, she starts having an activity, then it gets bigger, goes on to the other side. So what I want you to take care of here is seizure onset and sleep. 
Okay, if you just look at it, you might say, well, isn't this the seizure? No, because this is something that does not evolve. You see, it happens, and then, and this is something that is building up, is evolving, is, is progressing, is taking up more and more neurons include on the other side also. So this is the beginning of her seizure, right? This was the beginning of seizure. So you can see that it's much more, right? You've got a, like a spike wave. It's more evident on the right side than on the left side. And then as the seizure ends, you can see that it's already ended here. You don't have activity on the left side, which I, I do see here. It finishes while the left side is already almost getting, going back to normal, the right side still has activity, which would be, uh, I mean, epileptiform activity, which would be uh, uh, sorry about that, uh, the sharp wave and the slow wave complex. Okay, so here, is this patient awake or asleep? Well, I know he's awake and he's got this discharge here. I know the patient is awake because I have these blinking movements, right? Maybe if he closed his eyes, we would see the alpha rhythm, but he's awake and blinking. And this is the same patient, but sleeping, right? And he's got something on the other side. So that's why it's also important to see the patient while sleeping and while awake. Remember I said it's part of the protocol, you have to, to let the patient sleep, right? Because some things appear in, in sleep, which you do not see when you're awake. Okay, so this is a patient. It's during sleep. It's on the temporal uh, lobe right here. Look, you've got the phase reversal is an F8, which is anterior temporal, but it also goes a little bit, remember the, the field, it also goes a little bit to F4, which is the frontal on the right also meaning they're, they're very much together. And remember, I know this is not an artifact because there's a, it goes up more, more fast than it goes down, going down is slower, and then you have a slow wave and there's an electrical field. So this is very typical of interictal activity. And the same patient, right? He had this activity, right? It's being, the sharp codes are, are repeated here in the again in the tetra range but then he wakes up right so i couldn't say it was a seizure because it would have to, to last at least 10 seconds but for some reason he does wake up so i don't know how much you can say it's really uh, just an electrographic seizure or subclinical okay now we've seen the temporal lobe do you want to, is, does anybody want to make any question concerning the temporal lobe or we can go on Okay, no questions. So let's go on now to the frontal lobe. Well, the frontal lobe is big. It's got motor um, functions, but it also has some executive functions. So you can have both motor seizures and you can have seizures that also are, you have impaired awareness because of the executive functions. So, well, you can have, right? If you, if you get the motor cortex, you can have uh, grimacing, um, tonic-clonic movements, remember the, the versive movements, right? Then, and you also have the supplementary motor area in which you have posturings um, or versive, and there's one that's, that's uh, you're going to learn uh, hear about it is the Rolandic epilepsy, which mostly you have both sensory and uh, motor symptoms, usually starting on, on the face. Okay, so here's a seizure to a subclinical onset. So remember FP2, F4, F4, C4. So this is F4, right? So F4 frontal on the right is where the activity is happening. So it starts off, it builds up more and more and more, right? And then you go on to the next page and it goes on to all of the parasagittal electrodes. So it gets C4, P4 also, and also the temporal lobe. But the important thing is, where did it start here, right? If you get the seizure in the middle, you might not be sure if it started here or here, right? So this is a patient that's 37 years old. 
he had versive seizures to the left side. So, great, he has seizures to the left side and the activity is here on the right side. So, see, you've got a very small little sharp wave followed by a slow wave, right? And when he has the seizure, this is what happens. Remember, it was started here in F4, and then he, his head uh, moves on to the, to the left. Also, his, um, his torso goes to the left, and this is the activity. See, they're not so as sharp as one would think, but they are repeated, and they, they evolve, they grow into these co sharply contoured waves that uh, in the theta range. Okay, so this is just the beginning of the seizure. Okay, remember also that we can have, I think I showed it last time, that you can have something that's focal, like you've got here an activity in F3 and a little bit in F7, but then there's a, sec uh, a bilateral synchrony, right? This happens especially in the frontal lobe because there are many connections in the frontal lobe. So something that's focal can rapidly become uh, generalized on the EEG. So one has to be careful with that the uh, paralyzed seizure, or does he have a seizure that has a let's say a motor onset but not generalized motor? And this is the one I showed you guys, I think so. So you've got this activity. When you look at this, you say, Oh, this is a generalized seizure. See, it's spike wave and it's on both sides. But if you look carefully, you also have this activity here in F4. And it goes a little bit to FP1 and FP2 because they're close and FZ. But the phase reversal is right here on F4. And here you have them again. But if I pay attention only to this, I'll be mistaken. I'll think I have a generalized seizure when actually it's something with a focal beginning. Okay, so this, uh, yeah. This is just, this is another patient that has a frontal activity, see, over here, FP1, FP1, right? So it's very anterior, and he had the history with seizures during sleep. Unfortunately, I don't have a seizure of this patient. And here, what do we have, right? We've got something generalized, but not, not really, because this is where the activity is, you see? This is F3 and a little bit of FP1 and F7. And this progresses to something that's bilateral. So this would be a secondary bisynchrony. Okay, now this is another, this is a frontal seizure. See, it starts here on F4, right? It starts building up, right? And then it goes on, it starts um, uh, uh, progressing to other areas. And this is the middle of the seizure, right? It started on the right side, right? And now when you look at the middle of the seizure, see, it's here on the left side and the right side still goes on. So this basically, the seizure is still limited to, to the right side. And the end of the seizure, you see it still goes on a little bit on the right side, which is the side where it started, right? Onset, the middle of the seizure and the ending. And this patient did not have, um, thank you. This patient did not have impaired awareness. He was conscious during the seizure. It's a frontal seizure. Okay, and then this is a little girl that she, she had um, a dysplasia on the frontal lobe, on the right, uh, left frontal lobe. And what she had was a posture. She didn't lose consciousness. If we have time, you might even show the seizure later, but she has just this, a few slow waves here that at the end of the seizure, which is the only thing we found, it's very common also in frontal seizures not to see anything uh, on the EEG because sometimes the focus is, uh, is um, not superficial enough, but then because of the uh, clinical um, feed, high promoter seizures, when the patient thrashes the legs, the arms, like pedaling, usually during sleep. And then basically you don't see anything, just movement and, and muscle. Okay, now going on to, I don't have any parietal seizures, but going on to focal seizures, we have occipital lobe epilepsy. There's some syndromes in childhood, but what he's showing here is that he has, right, 
an activity, pH O2, right? O2 does not have somebody together and then another electrode together to show the phase reversal, but basically it's here, O2 and O2, right? The right occipital. This is 10 seconds before the visual aura. Then he starts having a visual aura and a focal clonic seizure. Obviously, because it goes on where to P4 and near C4, where, is the where the motor area is. But, and there are some, um, uh, some syndromes in childhood in which um, the occipital uh, activity appears when the patient uh, closes his eyes or is, has a, uh, uh, a non-fixation. This is very typical of childhood epilepsy. So you see he closes the eyes and the, the activity appears and he opens, it goes away, closes, and this is in the dark. Even without closing eyes, if, you, if the patient is not seeing, which they call fixation off, then it will also appear. Whether he closes eyes or not, as long as he's, he's not seeing anything, like being in the dark. Okay, and then there's benign occipital epilepsy. I brought this slide, it's not mine, because um, here you have, uh, you have the phase reversal. This is very nice. So it's C5, O1, O1, O2, O2, C6. So which is the common electrode here? O2, O2, right? And the phase reversal is right on the right occipital area. So sometimes you can change the program or the montage a little bit so you can see uh, th this is not uh, what we usually do. This is an exception. But you can do this if you want to, to study some area better. Okay, is it an occipital seizure? See? You've got this buildup here of theta waves on the left occipital um, region. But what happens is when you look at the video, that's why it's good to do video EEG, the mom was shaking the baby. And that's why this artifact showed up. So this is an artifact, okay? So if I don't have the video, it's a little bit harder to say what's going on here. I could mistake this for, for a seizure. Okay, and then you have the benign Rolandic epilepsy, which actually is central temporal spikes, but the name is very long. So it's, it's a, a syndrome that happens in, in childhood. It's benign, around 15 years, this child will have no more um, seizures. Actually, seizures are quite rare in, in this syndrome. What you do have is when the patient falls asleep, you have these sp um, sharp uh, waves near the Rolandic area, which would be C3 and C4, right, over the central uh, sulcus. So this is what they also now what they call it benign focal epileptic form discharges of childhood okay that's very long so many people still go on saying rolandic epilepsy so here lots of discharges on c3 right left central and also on the right central area there's there are lots of um discharges in this syndrome and this is interesting because although you have many discharges only during sleep, uh, it's not it, the the fact of having many discharges does not mean that it's less benign. So this is not a criteria. When you have many discharges, this this say that this epilepsy is uh, more severe. No, it, it doesn't. Okay, so here we have uh, another patient, right? So he's got here in C3 and in C3, but mostly only this one mostly only on the left side right central temporal spikes if you have a seizure usually it starts on c3 or, or central temporal c3 and t3 and you've got a build up right the the, the interictal spikes start repeating themselves and building up so this is the clinical onset okay it doesn't show the rest and this is one patient of ours um, so you see, he's got, this is the vertex wave, remember? So it's in CZ, in C4, in C3, so this means he's sleeping. But this is much sharper than the vertex sharp wave. And it's in C4, and then there's some on C3. So usually it's bilateral and during sleep. See, same patient, 
nice and pointy, which makes it different from sleep, the sleep uh, sharp wave. And the same patient, you see here he had, uh, this one he had more activity on the left side, and now the right side also has. And it's quite sharp, see, it looks angry, but it's not, it's a benign epilepsy. See, here is the sleep wave, sleep sharp wave on the vertex, and this is the epileptiform discharge, central temporal epileptiform discharge. Okay, now we've done with uh, most of the focal seizures. Of course, there's much more to, to, to see, but not in one hour. And let's go to the generalized seizures, right? So folk, generalized seizures, the whole cortex, focal seizure, just one uh, uh, limited to one hemisphere, okay? So the most common uh, is the tonic-clonic seizure, but uh, in children, absence seizures, which they used to call petit mal, are quite common. And uh, basically, the child just switches off, and you have this characteristic EEG, which is the spike wave, spike wave complex. And in one, within one second, usually you have three. So it's the three hertz spike and wave, and with a generalized projection. Of course, generalized, but sometimes you don't see it so well at the back because it's more, you see it more in the frontal regions, but it is generalized activity. So this is it, see? It starts suddenly and it finishes suddenly and the background EEG is normal. So this is very easy. So here, remember that one of the, we had those activating methods, activating. So what happened for childhood epilepsy, it's hyperkinia, uh, usually at least three minutes, but ideally up to five minutes and children can do this as from three, three years old. So if you have a three-year-old child, she is capable of, uh, of doing hyperpnea. And what do I see here? I see spike and wave, right? Very spiky and then a slow wave. And it's, it's generalized. And if I see in one second, remember from one little bar to the other is one second, one, two, three. So it's the three hertz spike wave generalized. And you see that it's normal before it starts abruptly, finishes abruptly, and then you have a normal EEG again. Okay, and what's this? This is a child doing hypertonia. She's in the third minute, uh, 17 years, not so childish. And you've got these slow waves that are one, two, three hertz. Okay, but, but you do not see the spike. Remember, here you have the spike wave and no spike right same thing here seven year old child right she has these slow waves but no spike so this is hyperventilation effect in which you can have this at the beginning i always had trouble also to differ differentiate this from from seizures okay so if you don't have the spike you can have this what they call hyperventilation effect which happens until the um, the brain is uh, has all the myelinization of the brain is is complete, which is 21 year, years old. So you can have this until 21 years old, and it does look very much like the seizure itself. So another thing to be careful. And this is the absence of epilepsy. So you have to have a nice a nice spike. Okay, and this one, you see, there's a spike wave, right? Spike wave, spike wave, spike wave, but the children was not doing hyperpnea. And if you look at the film, the child was shaking her head, a five-year-old child. So always be careful to see what, if, if the patient is hyperventilating, if he's sleeping, if he's moving around, what's going on. Okay, and this is during sleep. See, here's the, the vertex spike wave, very nice. And you've got, spike wave, spike wave, and spike wave during sleep, but it's very fast. To say that this would be a seizure, it would have to have at least three seconds when it's generalized, because that's the, the time that takes for your brain to re redo the uh, consciousness. It's like, you know, watching a, a movie. If you, the frames go by so fast, you don't realize you've got these, these frames, and the, and the working brain also has 
renews its consciousness every um, two, three seconds. So if it lasts more than three seconds, then you, you will have, uh, the patient will feel that uh, something was lost, like a, you know, a moment when he was out. Okay, and this is a tonic-clonic generalized seizure, but from the onset, see? So this is the tonic phase, then the clonic phase, right? And then this one is a little bit blurred, but it's the same thing as, as the secondary generalization, right? Except that here, it, it's not something focal that evolves to generalize. It's generalized from the beginning, okay? And this would be the tonic phase, the clonic phase, and that this is the clonic phase, okay? And this is something you see, the child is sleeping. Here's the vertex sharp wave. There are some um, spindles, right? And suddenly there's this activity and the child wakes up. So you have to be careful because children, when they wake up or when they fall asleep, they have what we called hypnagogic hypersynchrony if they are falling asleep or hypnopompic hypersynchrony if they're waking up. So if you see this in a child and then she wakes up, obviously it's not, not a seizure. And sometimes the technicians, they mark this as seizures, but when you look at the video, you see the patient is waking up and it has nothing to do with the patient's history. Okay, so, and remember that besides the hyperpnea, we do the, uh, the photo um, photo stimulation and i i call a photoparoxysmal response when the response is spiky right spike wave or polyspike wave when it outlasts the the stimulus and you see the minute the stimulation starts then you have this generalized activity polyspike wave or spike wave again here another photo stimulus and it happens again so you have to be careful not to confuse this with a photomyoclonic response, which is basically more in the frontal areas, which and during it stops exactly together with the, the stimulus. The stimulus stops, this photomyoclonic response stops. So this is muscle, right? Basically, it's the patient that starts blinking in resonance with the photostimulus. So you see here, it outlasts the sim the um, stimulus and here it's synchronous with this stimulus and there's another response that you can have that's called photic driving which means that the occipital lobe starts having like you know like uh, potentials provoked potential so here's the photic stimulation and the occipital uh, area has this um, these uh, the, the frequency is going to be uh, the same as the photic stimulus. So they call this driving. See, and here it's a little bit slower, but it's synchronous with the photo stimulus. So just as an example, right here, nine hertz, and you can see that you've got these little sharp waves, nine hertz. Of course, also I have a, a focus here. This is normal, okay? Do not confuse this with epileptic activity, but sometimes it's spiky and you might think uh, it's, it's a photoparoxysmal response. It's not, it's just that the evoked potential, some people just show it more than, than other people, right? And here, 18 hertz, and you can see the occipital uh, lobe is in synchronous with the 18 hertz photostimulus. Okay, now, Another generalized syndrome, which is very photosensitive. 30% of the patients have photoparoxysmal response, is uh, juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, which is probably genetic, not only on chromosome 6. But uh, the patient wakes up in the morning, especially if he's sleep deprived and has jerks, right? Myoclonus. And the EEG is um, generalized. See, for example, here. Now, so you have the photic stimulation, right? He comes along well, he's blinking, and during photic stimulation, you have polyspike waves. And this is a patient we had, so you can see that she, she has juvenile myoclonic epilepsy. During photostimulus, 9 hertz, she has this activity, you see, and it outlasts a little bit. And here, the stimulus finishes here. 
the outlast the stimulus a little bit, and it's a spike wave, mostly here, predominating on the posterior regions, which is quite typical. Same patient with 15 hertz. See, now she's got more poly spikes, not only spike wave, and as 18 hertz already, the response is not as uh, as evident. So there's some uh, there, there's some frequencies which are more let's say um, they they bring out the the photoparoxysmal response and it's usually between 15 and 18 hertz. This girl started with nine. Okay, and this is a sleep myoclonia. See, so the patient is sleeping. She woke up, and there's this thing during the myoclonia. If you look at it, it's nothing. It's just movement. It's just muscle and movement. She just basically had a jerk, like your patient, Contreras, the one you showed. Okay, she's myoclonia. You've got to have something. So this is basically a movement artifact when the patient wakes up. It's a normal physiologic myoclonia. Okay, now as this patient has a ge uh, generalized activity. He, I know him too. He's got um, um, juvenile myoclonic epilepsy. But if you look here, you see something more focal. So what does he have? Focal epilepsy or generalized epilepsy? So this is where you have to be careful because sometimes generalized epilepsy can have focal features. So that's when you need the history, right? He's got a history that's typical of juvenile myoclonic epilepsy. So I'm not going to be bothered by this, okay? What's most important is the, that he has myoclonia and he's got these polyspike uh, uh, waves during uh, the myoclonia. Okay, and this is another patient, oops, sorry. Another patient that he had cervical clonus and the, uh, the clonus, the movement of the head was concomitant with this activity, it was synchronous. Very discreet, but he would have it and he would kind of uh, be less concentrated during this, this event, but it's very fast. It's also generalized, okay. And you, you also have juvenile absence epilepsy. And what's different is that juvenile absence epilepsy, you don't have as many seizures. They are much, uh, you know, you don't have like 200 seizures a day like childhood uh, epilepsy. And the seizures are more sparse. And they also do have um, uh, tonic-clonic seizures, which in childhood epilepsy, you should not. Childhood absence epilepsy, if, if he, the child has a, a tonic-clonic seizure, it's probably juvenile absence epilepsy. But they all make part of the same group. Sometimes you have a family that has juvenile absence or juvenile myoclonic epilepsy. And what defines, if I'm going to call this myoclonic or absence, is the kind of seizure that predominates, because they all have myoclonic absence and uh, tonic-clonic uh, seizures. So basically, it's the same spectrum. Right, so there are some differences in, in the EEG, but this is more for specialists. So childhood absence epilepsy, uh, you've got three spike waves, juvenile um, absence epilepsy, they're a little bit faster, and there's this W, uh, less seizures. Myoclonic epilepsy, you've got polyspike waves, and there are some, some other variations. But this is, of course, you always have to put the EEG together with the look at it together with the, the clinical features of the patient. Okay, now we go on to the syndromes that are not so nice. Are the encephalopathies. Encephalopathies caused by the epilepsy. It's not an encephalopathy that has, for example, an anoxic uh, birth, right? Uh, uh, that you have lesions and then the patient has a, a mental retardation, has motor problems and also has seizures. And the seizures are just a, one more thing in, in the whole story. These uh, epileptic encephalopathies, the main thing is the epilepsy and it is the epilepsy that is, let's say, destroying the brain. And if you can stop uh, the seizures, this patient might be able to progress uh, neurologically. So Lennox-Gastaut syndrome uh, is characterized by many seizure types. 
cognitive dis dysfunction, and in the electroencephalogram, you've got these spike waves, but they're not three hertz, they're much slower. They're two to five, five uh, two and a half uh, uh, hertz. So this would be normal, right? And this Lennox Gasto awake, right? There's a, there's a slow background and these spike waves, two to 2.5 hertz discharges. And sometimes they, they occur in trains. And this also characterizes the typical absence because they're slower and they're not, you know, they don't start as uh, suddenly like the typical absence. And sometimes you don't know when they finish. And basically it's in child that's already cognitively impaired. So you don't see, sometimes you don't see much difference in the child's expression. So this is in Lennox Gasto, right? And then this, this is what, uh, the difference between being awake in Lennox Gasto and asleep. So during wakefulness, you've got that spike wave to hertz. And asleep, you've got the, what we call a recruiting rhythm, which usually is accompanied by um tonic seizures so you see you have this it looks like the, the tonic phase of the tonic clonic seizure but it's just the fast rhythm and then you've got a suppression right here and this is it this is the what they call the recruiting rhythm which means that it looks as if you know it kind of grows like a triangle opening and it's as if it were recruiting more and more uh, neurons, but actually it's the whole cortex it's at the same time and followed by a slow wave. Okay, this also, this is probably a tonic seizure, but you see it starts small and then it grows and then it has a suppression after. So this is what they call recruiting because it's, it's like he's calling more and more cells to take part in, in the activity. And sometimes the tonic seizure, you can have a suppression and then the fast rhythm, right? Uh, also, Lennox Gasto has atonic seizures, so they've got atypical absences, atonic seizures, and tonic mostly axial. So we say it's the three A's of Lennox Gasto syndrome. A typical uh, absence, atonic seizures, atonic seizures, and tonic axial, because it's mostly the, sometimes only the eyes roll up. So what happens? What's nice here is that you see that there's muscle, then suddenly there's a spike and there's no muscle anymore, and then muscle goes back. So usually to say, if, you know, to know if the patient has a myoclonia, a tonic uh, phenomenon or a tonic, we should put uh, muscle electrodes, usually on the neck and the arm. Okay, another severe syndrome, another uh, encephalopathy is West syndrome. It has a triad, right, which is a normal children that starts uh, losing uh, all the um, neurologic uh, evolution up till then. And um, spasms, which at the beginning, the spasms, some, some doctors think it's like a hiccup or, you know, a, a, a tummy pain because they kind of squeeze themselves. And uh, the EEG is very characteristic. It's called hips arrhythmia because hipster means big and arrhythmia, it's arrhythmic, right? So everything is very big and arrhythmic. It's disorganized, uh, discontinuous, high. And if you treat the patient, now we also use Viga Brain to interrupt this and maybe the, the child will begin uh, recuperating, you know, being able to have a, a better neurologic evolution. So this, right, infantile spasm is, is what happens in hips arrhythmia, so everything is big, everything is chaotic, I don't know what's front, what's back, if he's awake, if he's sleeping, right, and during the spasms, what you have is a decremental activity, there's a suppression during the spasm, right, so this, this is a hips arrhythmia, you see, because this is at conventional sensitivity, so Everything is very big. And see, this is another example, but now the sensitivity is a little uh, better to see the phenomenon. So it's multifocal, generalized, slow waves. It's completely chaotic. And this is the spasm, right? You have the spasm and there's, uh, the, the activity suddenly stops and then comes back slowly, but this is what we call a suppression. Which, which happens, remember, after the tonic-clonic seizure. 
here another spasm this is nice and it's generalized but but people don't really it's it's considered unknown because you can have a, a focal lesion and have uh ipsorrhythmia so it's more age related actually than etiology related okay the, this is just just so uh a little table of the epileptics encephalopathy so here you have west syndrome you have uh, lennox gastaut syndrome and uh, there's this one which i'm going to show is continuous spike and wave during sleep which is no, not yet it's this one see so the patient has these spikes and during sleep they become very frequent taking up most of 90 percent so it's actually it's a status epileptic it's during sleep and this uh, the, 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 if you don't interrupt this, the child goes on losing and losing and losing its neurologic, neurologic activities. And if you can interrupt, maybe, um, especially vigabatrin or uh, corticosteroids, you can um, revert this. And this, this is um, something that's very rare. It's called ICAR-G syndrome. Uh, of course, this is hips arrhythmic, EEG, right, because of the, because of the age. As I said, it's more age related. And you've got um, the, um, the infantile spasms. But what's interesting here is that you see this is the left side, right, left, and right, is that they're not synchronous. And why does this happen? Because the ICARG syndrome also has a, a non uh, agenesia of the corpus callosum. So basically, it's two independent brains. That's why it doesn't synchronize. Okay, status epilepticus during sleep. And one of the uh, one thing that's uh, um, one um, syndrome that is also under um, continuous spike waves is Landau Kleffner. Uh, these patients, they they have this patient actually. He was we saw him like um, a few years ago, but he was sent by. Uh, oh, sorry. He was sent to psychiatry because he had this autistic regression. Actually, what happens is, th is that they have a, an auditive, uh, they hear, but they don't understand what they're hearing, which is like an, a, a discrimination of phasia. So wait, wait, uh, awake, everything is fine. And during sleep, he has this activity, continuous activity. And this is a status epilepticus, and it's this that's, let's say, destroying the patient's brain progressively. Well. Now here, uh, this is just to show, right? So during sleep, remember focal, right? A focal seizure and a generalized seizure during sleep. So this is the difference, right? Generalized starts together and focal, one part, uh, one part of the brain is, uh, has the seizure. Okay, another thing that we have to talk about is status epilepticus, right? Because it's an emergency. When uh, you have a tonic-clonic status epilepticus, it's not so hard, but there are the non-convulsive status epilepticus, either a status that started tonic-clonic, but then uh, with time, uh, there's an electromechanical uh, uh, dissociation. So you have a, a horrible electroencephalogram with activity and the patient is in a coma or catatonic. And you don't realize the patient is in uh, in having uh, uh, continuous seizures. This is important for psychiatrists. I don't know if there are any around because sometimes you get a catatonic patient and he's having um, seizures, and status epilepticus. Well, uh, this is a, a pattern we call burst suppression. Apparently, in Spanish, it's brote suppression, but you have activity and then a suppression, activity and a suppression. Uh, which is something that might happen in um, status epilepticus or after a, um, um, how do you say, a, when your heart stops, a, a cardiac arrest, right? And when you have a status epilepticus like this, you start giving the patient medicines and you try to reach this pattern, okay? This shows that you're managing to control the seizures. But here are just some examples. This was a patient that was catatonic. He's got this activity. This is pre-diazepam. And when we gave him diazepam, the um, 
the, the epileptic form activity was gone and he, clinically he was better. Another one, this is a, a patient, 44 years. He was just disorientated, spatially and temporally. He was uh, a little bit weird. And when we made the EEG, this was the pattern, a generalized activity. And also in some moments he had a burst suppression pattern. And after diazepam, see, practically normal. Of course, it doesn't last um, forever. You have to treat the patient. Diazepam will, will last for a few minutes. Okay, so this is, uh, I don't know if you do this in Colombia, I think you should. It's uh, Purple Day, it's March 26. It's the Epilepsy Awareness Day. Okay, well, uh, how, how long do we still have in time? Do, do you want to show us something more? Yeah, uh, what time is it? Oh, it's already one hour gone by, right? No, because I could show seizures, but I think it's a little bit late, right? For that, no, it's I, I think, I think we, we have some time to, to do so. Okay, let's see a few seizures then. Yeah, this, that this would is be great. Really, yeah. Yes, because the, the video AG changed, revolutionized um, epilepsy. See if I manage. Okay. So, so, same thing, double banana, right? And you can see already that this patient, she she had a vascular malformation and a hippocampal sclerosis, the dual pathology. So here we've got slow waves on the right side, okay? And then these slow waves go on. She has it. And there's a moment when she starts moving about, oops, moving, moving. But when you look on this side, you see that these these slow waves, they're faster and more, um, they're more compact, but they're basically here on the right side, okay? See? And this is the seizure. And uh, you'll know it's the seizure because I'm going to show it to you. And then the seizure eventually, okay, every time the page changes, it's 10 seconds gone by, okay? All right. So let's see what she does, which is very interesting. To the beginning of the seizure. Oops. Not to do that. Well, it's lost. I did something stupid here, but let's go back. Okay. All right, let's see what she does. I'm not used to this computer yet. No. Okay, what we're going to do is go back from the beginning. All right. Okay, let's go back. Okay, so here she is, just sitting down, and there's a moment. Yeah. Sorry for the noise, the background noise. Okay, now she's going to say she's not feeling well. See, she moves and you see muscle. Look, now she goes for the event button. 
because she's feeling something. She says, I'm not feeling well. And the nurse asks her to lift her arms and say her name. Did you notice that her arm fell? She didn't notice her arm fell. It's, uh, the seizure is on the right side and her left side fell, which is usually the side that's dystonic, but it's like she had a negligence here. And listen to what's going to happen to her voice now. See, she starts having automatisms with the ipsilateral hand. And this hand is immobile, right? She doesn't move this hand. See how her voice changes? Actually, we cannot hear her. You can't see her? Uh, hear. See, we can ah, hear. Ah, okay, sorry about that. But her voice changes, it becomes very thin. I'm sorry about that if you can't hear. Well, but they, you, as you can see, no the, the so seizure is on the right. On the left, and then she became bilateral, right? No, no. Uh, it's always on the same side. What happens is that uh, she was holding both hands up, right? And the hand that's contralateral. So the seizure is the one that falls, see? And this hand, the ipsilateral hand, is the one that has automatisms, okay? This is typical of, of seizures, of uh, temporal lobe seizures. And this is one way you can lateralize the seizure. Well, let's go on to another one. Let me show you, um, show you, uh, Worse, Marcelo Mitsu. Okay, show you some. Okay, so you see this, right? Poly spike wave, but more on further because the first one, she doesn't have anything over here, I think. Okay. So if you pay attention to his hand, over here, right? So I'm going to show this green line it's it's synchronous with the with the film and the electric cephalogram right so let's go here so one two and did you see he had a little jerk it's very discreet let's go back sorry i hope you've seen it because it's very sometimes it's very discreet so one two and See, the jerk was concomitant with this, this feature. The jerk on the arm? Yeah, no, actually it's, uh, the, the jerk is generalized, but it can be, uh, that's, one, that's one mistake. You think the, the seizure is focal when actually it's bilateral because the, the activity is um, bilateral, right? Here, let me go a little bit more. Here, you see? Again, see, remember I said sometimes it can be a little focal, but as you see, one, two, and very light little jerk. So this is juvenile myoclonic epilepsy. What I want to show, yeah, it's got several jerks here. But no, not this one. Can't. So this is a generalized seizure, right? Yeah. Um, let me show you a, a seizure, a temporal lobe seizure that has a secondary generalization or let's say, um, oh, what's wrong here? Why does it have this interference? It shouldn't have this interference here, but I wonder why. Hmm. 
well, I'm sorry about the interference. I'm not managing to, to remove it. Oops. I, I changed the... <laughs> Okay. So even with the interference, you can see that see seizure happens. So what happens here is first of all, the patient is sleeping and he wakes happens on the left, right? On the left, on the left, and then you have a tonic phase and then the clonic phase, remember? You've got burst suppression, burst suppression. And after the seizure, he's out. I don't know why this, this, this happened, but anyway, let's see the seizure itself. So the patient was sleeping, right? Make him a little bit bigger. Computer is really sensitive, right? What happens? So he's, he has a seizure on the left side. See, he wakes up, look at the staring, his eyes, the mouth automatisms. And he's unaware, you can see. Now you already have activity on the left side. And he, it goes from the temporal to the frontal lobe. See, he's having a motor seizure now. Only on one side. Right, only on the left or the right side. And now, yes, now he's going to have a, a tonic phase. Everything is fast on the EEG. She shouldn't be holding him like this, okay? This is not the right thing to do. You can hurt the patient. And then the clonic phase which starts with the very fast clonic movements and they start getting more and more sparse. And so does the EEG. You've got that um, burst suppression. See, and now every time you have the burst, he has a contraction. Burst. And that's how slowly, slow, and now the seizure has ended. And uh, there's a suppression of the activity, and he's in a post so let's say, almost coma, right? Let's see what else. See. Let me put this in alphabetical order. Okay, it's easy. Okay, in this. This was a university professor. She taught logic at university. So here we go. Suddenly, we've got this, right? And where's the, 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 the activity? See, this is just movement. There is no epileptiform activity. And look what happens. His seizure is not, it's not typical at all. That's not a seizure, not an epileptic seizure at least. Okay, what I want you to notice is how this is different from the seizure we saw um, um, had a clonic phase. eventually the cl uh, clonus were becoming more and more with a bigger and bigger interval and this is something that's completely atypical this is a non-epileptic seizure psychogenic non-epileptic seizure let 
me put Wallace. So, as I said, sometimes you don't, when it's a frontal hypermotor seizure, it's very difficult to see where the, where the seizure starts. So this gentleman had seizures during sleep, so he's sleeping, right? And then suddenly he starts flashing about and I, it's hard to see what's going on, right? But what's interesting here is the, um, uh, that clinically I know this is a seizure and not a non-epileptic seizure because of the characteristics. First of all, he was asleep. For sure he was asleep, which is very rare to have a non-epileptic seizure, psychogenic seizure, uh, when you're sleeping. Have you noticed how he regains consciousness rapidly? And this is what we call a hypermotor seizure. It begins in the frontal lobe. Even if I don't see anything um, not pointing in the, in the electroencephalogram that points to the frontal lobe, it's very typical. Okay, I want to show you that. I'm trying to look for the most <laughs> typical ones. Oh, this one. Look. Not sure. Oh, sorry, the interference again. I have to see with the technician. But he's got. Uh, we won't be able to see it. He's got um, a generalized epilepsy now, but maybe the seizure, not the EEG. Go back. So it's it's a generalized EEG. I'm sorry, but I'd like you to see what he does. It's not progressing. There we go. See, that's a generalized tonic seizure. It's a pity, but we can't see the. Oh, here, maybe here we can see a bit. Looks the generalized activity, but that's too much interference. And it's a shame. Okay. Ah, this is interesting because. This patient was, um, he came to do the study, the video AG, because he had a story of non-epileptic seizures. So this is what you see, now, basically just movement, right? Big mess. Right? And the seizure,
let me see, he was trembling a bit. It's got this opistotinus, which is typical for, this is the beginning. Okay, so it's, it's, it goes on and on for hours and hours. And this is a, a non-typical for epilepsy. So this is, and also there's no, there's only artifacts in the EEG. So we can say this is a, probably a non-epileptic uh, psychogenic seizure. But then the same patient is with his girlfriend, right? Oh, this is the same. Yeah, he moves around a bit, he wakes up here, right? So up till now, there's nothing. He just wakes up. But then he sits and look what happens. He's just sitting in the dark. He's not doing anything. Look what happens to his EEG. See? On the left side. And what he's doing is nothing. Just sitting there, looking at... And then his girlfriend asked, did he just have a seizure when it finishes? He said, yes, I did. So you see, when he has seizures, right, a focal seizure, but he also has non-epileptic seizures. So you have to be very careful when you give a diagnosis of non-epileptic seizures, because 50% of, of these patients also have epileptic seizures. Um, this is also a hypermotor seizure. Some of them are quite dramatic. See this one? I can see that he's got something starts here on the on the left side, and clinically. Go a little bit further. So it starts probably on the temporal lobe, but then it goes to the frontal lobe. Because here he's... And the electroencephalogram is already showing... Okay, and then he goes on and on. The reason that uh, this doctor, which is me, is lying on top of him is because the seizure he had before he jumped out of the bed and, and broke all the electrodes. So we were trying to be careful with that. So this is also a hypermotor seizure, right? Let me see this one. No, I think, I, I think, I don't know if I showed this one to you guys, the electroencephalogram, the whole exam, right? The girl that had seizures. I think I did, right? She's sleeping and then she has, she has these. Here she's awake. And then she has, oops, here, here's going to be nice. She has these spike waves. Right? Okay. 
what I want to show is that during, oops, it wasn't this one I showed. Well, first let's see the, okay, let's see. But while she has a spike wave, okay, start here. Pay attention to her face. Do you notice around her mouth, see, little contraction? I hope you guys yeah. saw it. Yeah, yeah, I'm okay. So well, this, this is an absence seizure with myoclonic movements. But it's, it's, a, it's an absence seizure, okay? During hyperventilation, so. And then she goes back to normal. Oh, and this is a, uh, uh, this patient, he had a, this is 30 minutes long, I'm not going to show everything, but he was in a, see, he, he had an accident, so this is frontal, right? And here he is having these, uh, this activity, and he's all happy reading. Then if you go on, there's a moment, see, there are lots of uh, discharges. On the left side, and there's a moment when he starts having this activity. See, it's already an epileptiform activity, but nothing is going on with him yet. See, he goes on reading, and here we have this activity. Very spiky on the left frontal region. And apparently, you know, it's non-eloquent. He just goes on reading. See, so it's, so now it's subclinical. Now it starts getting. It's almost already going to the other side. And what happens? Versive seizure. And then sonic phase. Then he starts the clonic phase. If you see the EG, you'll see it's going to get sparser and sparser until you have the burst suppression. See, now we start to see burst suppression. Okay, so the seizure finished, right? But not, look, on the right side, he still has a lot of activity. So basically he's just breathing deeply and they think the seizure is over, but it isn't. And then, so he goes on and you see that he still, look, look at this activity here and here. So this is a, right, look, look at this. This is a status epilepticus, non-convulsive, see? Because you think, you know, it looks as if he's just breathing deeply and look what happens. Look at his EEG. See? Very spiky, very pointy. 
And then he goes on to another generalized tonic seizure. Now see on this side, see how spiky it is? And there he is just breathing. Go on. And then he has another generalized seizure. And then when the seizure finishes, the activity has not finished, see, on the right side. It goes from left to right and keeps on the right side. And then it goes back to the left side, the third seizure. So he, he does not regain his consciousness between one seizure and the other. And then, well, now she gives him an injection of midazolam, right, during... And look what happens after the midazolam. So it takes a little time to work another seizure and da, 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 da. still not right he's just breathing and you have lots of activity until the midazolam kicks in it takes a few minutes there look what happened right so activity and boom suppression Okay, and then slowly, slowly, you see that you can see that the uh, the left side is slower than the right side, which is where the seizure began. And he's and you can see he's breathing different here. He's in the basically snoring, and this is the post -take. So this was a status epilepticus because it lasted thirty minutes. Thankfully, he had no no lesions. So well, it's already 21, it's already yeah. nine o'clock and 45. So I think you've had uh -huh. enough, right? Thank you. I, I was wondering in, in the EG, I, I see a little design on the right. Does it show you where it starts the seizure or is it just? Oh, no, no, like sometimes we write down like after. No, no, uh, we, we write down. And sometimes the patient pushes the, the button. No, how do I get Oh, this? wonderful. This is a wonderful, I mean, it's an epic effort that you do to try to show us all different kind of seizures uh -huh. in just one hour. I, I yeah. really, really appreciate it. Um, the, <laughs> love the iceberg, but it, it should give us a uh, very nice idea of what we can find and the different types of epilepsy and how, mm -hmm. how, they, how we can identify them in the EEG. So thank you very much. Okay, I thank you, you for your patience. And <laughs> see you tomorrow. Yes, I tomorrow. I don't know if someone, someone left is, uh, wants to do any question. Oh yeah, it was, it, it was a really nice approach showing us from temporal to different, the different lobes, how they, they present. Thank you very much. Very, very nice. Okay, nice. Thank I will you. say that uh, we all want to go and take a coffee or something. So let's meet tomorrow. Okay. And let me, let me make an, an invitation. If any of you want to learn how to do video EEG in Brazil, we always have open doors. Ah, oh, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much. Sure. This is this is also the idea to establish these collaborations. Have mm -hmm. you yes. visiting us soon? We want to start mm -hmm. this program in Colombia, so I'm sure we we will uh, appreciate your help and guidance. Okay. Great. Okay. Okay, okay see you well, tomorrow. Good night. Good night. <laughs> see you Have tomorrow. Have a great night. Ciao. Ciao, ciao.